So today is lunchtime stock club for July 13th, 2020. Uh, let us begin by taking a look at where we are uh, in the US markets a year to date. Uh, I like to keep track of how the markets are performing uh, in three major segments of the market that I do follow pretty closely. Um, the labels are wrong on this slide, I'm now seeing, uh, but I will fix those right now. The blue line on top is the S&P 500. The red line is the EFA, Europe, Australia, Asia, Far East Index. That's the index of uh, large cap developed country stocks around the world. And the uh, green line at the bottom is the S&P Small Cap 600 index, uh, which represents the performance of the smaller companies in the market. So year to date, uh, halfway through the year now, the S&P 500 is actually up 2.29% from the start of the year. Um, it's still below the highs that were reached in uh, early March. The EFA index is down 8.11% for the year, and the small cap still trailing at 16.73% down uh, year to date. Of course, all three indexes are up substantially from the lows reached in the third week of March, um, but still well off the highs reached earlier in the year. So I think there is still lots to be determined about uh, the shape of the market recovery, uh, the state of the market, the health of the market, um, the demand of uh, investors for shares uh, in uh, particularly large cap stocks, but as well in small cap stocks. Uh, during uh, bear markets and down markets and sideways markets, that's when uh, small cap stocks uh, tend to get hurt the most, but when recovery comes, they tend to lead the way out of the bear markets into the bull market. So uh, small caps down year to date, and uh, that uh, is pretty much to be expected um, and not very worrisome for us. Of course, we don't buy the market with our tools, we buy individual stocks. So your performance, of course, may vary. Now, when we look at the S&P 500 PE ratio, uh, on the far right, you can see it's taken a big jump uh, up to 27.38. That's the, the estimated trailing 12-month earnings uh, calculated PE ratio of the S&P 500. In May, uh, the, the last time that we had this webinar, the PE ratio was 20. So that's a significant uptick from uh, in two months uh, to that level of 27. And you can see uh, that that is one of the highest PE ratios uh, prior to the late 1990s uh, when things uh, really changed uh, quite significantly in terms of seeing some excessive valuations and uh, some contractions. But um, again, the general uptrend of P ratios for the S&P 500 has been uh, upward, especially in, since the 1970s as a result of uh, different interest rate policies, the availability of capital and the demand for stocks. Uh, I think what this uh, 27 PE is telling us is that uh, investors are discounting the downside um, and we'll talk more about that as well uh, in just a minute. Uh, but what's important is where we are relative to earnings of the S&P 500. These are, of course, representing the large company stocks primarily across the, the broad swath of American business. And you can see that the earnings, the estimated earnings are down to $115. They were as high as $140 uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So we're seeing uh, those earnings falling off as the earnings have been reported for most recent quarters uh, and companies are coming out with the actual data. Um, so again, earnings down, PE ratios up, uh, stock prices uh, going up, uh, represented by the uh, those indexes. So it's kind of telling us that investors are are uh, not especially worried about the overall direction of the market. Now, when we look at, the, at what analysts uh, have been, uh, the decisions they've been making about uh, the earnings potential of, of companies in the S&P 500. This graph shows you the average change 
uh, or rather the quarterly change from the start of a quarter to the end of the quarter uh, of earnings estimates uh, going forward uh, for the quarterly uh, for quarterly uh, earnings estimates. And so you can see for the second quarter of 2020 over on the far right from the beginning of the quarter, which would have been um, on um, April 1st, so April, May, June, to the end of that quarter uh, on June 30th, analysts revised uh, the average uh, earnings estimate for the S&P 500 went down 37%, and that is uh, the biggest change in quarterly earnings estimates uh, from uh, analysts uh, since the second quarter of 2015. So uh, that's a, a long period. You can see, yes, we've had downward revisions uh, often. Um, in, in fact, in this period on this graph, according to fact set, uh, the first quarter of 2018 was the only quarter in which estimates uh, increased during the uh, during the quarter. Uh, well, there was a slight increase in the uh, the first second quarter of 2018 as well, but the rest of the time, uh, analysts uh, tending to uh, reevaluate their earnings estimates during the quarter and then uh, downwardly revising them. Uh, maybe that says something about the overall optimism of analyst estimates, which may be a little too rosy. Uh, and then as more and more information becomes available, uh, those estimates get revised downward. Uh, but uh, I think the takeaway here is that analysts uh, looking at the second quarter are expecting uh, some pretty serious drop-offs in for many companies, um, especially those large cap stocks. Uh, and not not unsurprisingly, uh, as many companies have been deeply affected uh, by COVID-19, by the, the recession that has come upon us, um, and uh, all of the, the havoc that business closings and unemployment uh, will wreak on an economy. So my takeaway, uh, kind of overall, when I look at the market right now, that P/E ratio is very high. Uh, that tells me that demand for stocks is still very high, and investors are not really worried about the recession or the effects of COVID-19. They're finding pockets of strength, um, and they're finding that reassuring. I think that many large cap stocks are overvalued right now, uh, which is kind of an ironic situation to be in when there's so much so much volatility in the market uh, and there still appears to be quite a lot of uncertainty but many large caps i think as investors have been searching for safety thinking well if i hold on to uh, companies like apple and uh, uh, amazon and facebook and uh, microsoft uh, hold on to these big companies and google alphabet maybe some of these companies are not going to be as impacted um, during the uh what's what, what's going to be coming in the next couple of quarters as we expect uh the gdp to continue to be down so uh whether that is actually a safe strategy or not is up for debate but i think that still uh, is my take on what's going on in the market right now there's still the the tina effect uh in a, which is uh, to say there is no alternative to stocks that uh, investors don't see bonds, don't see cash uh, savings accounts as being viable. Um, they're not going wholesale into precious metals. Uh, so they're letting their money sit in the stock market and not moving to other asset classes right now. Um, I think the near and the midterm still present lots of risks to huge segments of the economy. Uh, it's, and it would be I, it, it's hard for me to see a case where that statement is not true at least based on headlines that you see every day um, i don't believe that uh, uh, that any of the media is overblowing the the impact of business closings and covid 19 uh impact of the the um, uh, on the health of the american uh, people uh, really in jeopardy and there are going to be some tough decisions that some states are going to have to be making uh, and are making right now about the balance uh, between reopening the economy and uh, preserving the health of their citizens. Uh, so to me, the, the 
the conclusion is that there's a, still a lot of uncertainty and we just don't know how long things are going to go on. And if you have an investing strategy that depends on having a high level of certainty, uh, that's almost impossible to find in this particular market. Uh, so for me, I think uh, it's good to continue to think defensively, which in terms of our approach to stocks doesn't mean moving assets out of the market, but looking at the types of companies that are likely to perform reasonably well uh, during uh, economic hard times, who have the potential to uh, perform better than their peers, um, that have the potential perhaps to not perform as poorly as some other companies, uh, and uh, that we hold on to those companies for the duration, um, sit tight, wait things out, um, and continue to make as many many moves as we can to improve our portfolios when uh, situations present themselves and opportunities arise. Uh, so uh, it's still more the same, um, but uh, I did also note from facts that, um, so that this is very uh, current information. This is uh, the consensus price change projections for the S&P 500 sectors uh, over the next 12 months. So uh, on the left is the energy sector, which has been pounded, it's been beaten down. Um, and the consensus for S&P 500 uh, companies in the energy segment sector are for a 24.5% price change uh, in the coming year. Uh, financials are also have also been beaten down as interest rates have dropped away. So has their ability for many of those companies to make money uh, when conducting the basic business of banking, which is uh, uh, buying and selling money, if you will. And uh, so a lot of those bank stocks have been beaten down. Um, there's potentially opportunities there, and I certainly see. Uh, some bank stocks continue to appear on my screens, especially the regional bank stocks, uh, that I think there are some opportunities there. I would agree. Certainly healthcare uh, projected to do, perform very well uh, with an 11.2% price change on average over the next uh, 12 months, um, and you, followed by utilities with a 10.8% price change. Um, and that's kind of interesting. If we're looking at just the change of price and we add in the typical dividend yield, this is suggesting that maybe there are utilities, um, if, as we think defensively, that maybe there are some utilities that are reasonably valued right now uh, that would deliver some uh, greater gains in the next, uh, in the next 12 months. Um, again, they don't come up on my screen because of our bias towards total return and, and uh, capital appreciation over dividends, uh, but um, your mileage may vary and perhaps there's something there that, that you might wanna uh, take a look at. If you own some of those utility stocks, maybe there are some opportunities um, that you might take advantage of. Uh, consumer staples, also known as consumer defensive, uh, poised to perform well with a 10.2% uh, average price gain over the next uh, 12 months. Um, and again, those are the grocery stores, the discount stores, the, uh, um, the drug stores uh, that are going to perform uh, and see revenues um, maintaining during economic hard times. Um, and then followed up after that, industrials, real estate, uh, and the average of the S&P 500 at this point, projection of a 6.3% price gain. So we're already up uh, 2%, 2.2%, 2.3% for the year to date. Uh, so uh, perhaps a third of the way towards this, uh, this scenario that uh, analysts and mass have, have are foreseen for 2020. Um, uh, below average are materials, communication services, information technology, and consumer discretionary stocks. Um, interesting that uh, IT information technology is below average. That may be that many of those stocks have been bid up um, uh, as the work from home movement took took uh, went into a, went into effect. Uh, and so there, there may be just not a lot of upside uh, left. And consumer discretionary, no surprise, we're seeing lots of restaurant stocks, 
uh, being hammered uh, because they can't operate at full capacity if they can operate at all. Um, many retail stores, again, um, uh, for discretionary purchases, um, consumers uh, are just not out there spending or even online spending um, as they had been in the past. Uh, so the essential stuff is in the consumer staples. The consumer discretionary is uh, um, the, those other segments. Um, related to that, in our last small cap informer newsletter, uh, which was out at the end of June, we uh, uh, ceased coverage of Canada Goose Holdings. Uh, and again, relates to uh, this, uh, the placement of consumer discretionary here on this graph this week. Uh, I just didn't see the potential for Canada Goose to outperform uh, in the near to midterm uh, to perform well enough at a level that would justify tying up capital in that stock when you could find other opportunities. Um, they just, uh, had a strategy that might have been healthy to uh, launch more uh, direct company-owned stores that would sell their products as opposed to a wholesale model where they would sell their garments to other uh, retail chains. Uh, so uh, foot traffic in their stores largely dried up. Um, and uh, this is a, a luxury item a uh, high priced item. And so while there will always be a market for those types of goods, uh, it's hard to make the case that uh, during a, an extended re recession or a global recession that the company would have, um, uh, would have outperformed um, many of the other opportunities that, that were perceived to be a, perhaps a little more applicable to our times. So uh, I understand uh, this consumer discretionary remains a tricky sector uh, to, um, um, and that would include airlines as well, uh, airlines, travel companies. I mean, that is just a, uh, that is just a big open question for me in terms of when, when, Americans will start traveling again. Um, one bright spot uh, that I've mentioned before in some of the webinars is the performance of Winnebago uh, and LCI Industries, which is the maker of RV parts, um, seeing increased demand uh, in the second, first and second quarter uh, as people said, well, I can't travel on vacation. You know what? If we had a motorhome, if we had an RV, we could go anywhere we wanted to and we wouldn't have to worry about hotels. We wouldn't have to worry um, as, about eating in restaurants because we, we'd have our kitchen and our bed with us all the time and we can go um, take our couple of week, our you know getaway vacations a little closer to home where we've got everything we need uh, in a, in our um, on in our um, uh, in our RV, uh, and so again, we don't uh, put stocks into baskets and ex always uh, assume that they're always going to perform according to the historical patterns because of the pressures of uh, and demands of this current market. We want to continue to identify opportunities when they do arise. So I just thought this is an interesting way to think about um, some of those stocks. Um, again, I look at that energy, uh, the expectation for, um, uh, for energy stocks in that sector has just been hammered. Uh, it's hard for me to build a case to, to go jumping into oil and, and gas, uh, whether it's exploration or um, uh, marketing or um, sales. Uh, it's this just seems to me very very difficult uh, to figure out what the right valuation is, what the right time to get into those stocks. But um, if you were doing your research and you thought, well, you know, maybe it's time to get a little exposure. Uh, energy stocks have been beaten down significantly. Uh, maybe there's room to buy an energy ETF. Uh, in your portfolio and round out your diversification without worrying so much about individual companies. Uh, that might be um, something to think about. So just musing there, um, let's go ahead and move on. I wanted to talk about the, uh, uh, oh, before I go, I so, uh, Diane asked, what does FTM stand for? FTM is forward 12 months. So TTM is trailing 12 months, FTM is forward 12 months. Uh, so um, not really, not necessarily the next four quarters, but the next 52 weeks. Um, 
So uh, I wanted to give you an update on our stock newsletters. Uh, we uh, updated the websites with some performance graphs and pulled in the data as of uh, the end of uh, the first quarter uh, through uh, June 30th. Um, and so the investor advisory service uh, over the last three, 15, and 20 years on this graph, you can see significantly outperformed the Wilshire 5000 uh, for the th three years as of uh, June 30th, not September, uh, not July 13th, but as of June 30th. Uh, the three-year performance is just just neck and neck with the Wilshire 5000, uh, and again, we're we're pretty happy. Uh, with that as a near-term, mid-term uh, rate of return. The longer term is where we really focus. Uh, and when you look at the lifetime performance of the IS uh, since uh, January 1st, 1996, which is when Holbert started tracking the performance of the newsletter, uh, the picks of in the IS are up 11.5%, while the Wilshire 5000 has a return of 8.8% .8 a year uh, during that same time frame. So that's a pretty significant outperformance. That's much better than most mutual funds that track the broader market are able to do, uh, much better than most uh, money managers can achieve over the long term. So we're pretty happy about that. Uh, we updated the website so that we can continue to uh, provide those performance updates on a more regular basis now. So we figured out a way to, to semi-automate it. Um, so we're pretty, uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty, pretty good at, uh, 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 pretty well equipped right now to, as we go forward to provide regular updates. Eric asks, uh, if it's not too complicated, can you give us an idea how the performance of IES is determined? Uh, this is uh, the Performance tracking for the investor advisory service comes from uh, Mark Holbert and the company that he runs, Holbert Ratings, which is a third-party validation service, if you will, for newsletters such as ours. Uh, so he receives each issue, uh, and then uh, he uh, tracks several hundred different investing newsletters. So he's got a, a huge library of performance data about different strategies, different uh, newsletters that perform uh, perform well. Uh, over time, and he's able to calculate our performance. Now, what distinguishes the Investor Advisory Service from many other stock newsletters is that those newsletters often have a model portfolio uh, where they're saying, here's 15 stocks, buy, this month buy this stock and sell that stock. Uh, and so they're providing updates uh, on a managed portfolio with perhaps a percentage uh, allocation that they suggest for each stock in the portfolio. Um, and they're making dynamic changes as they go along. Uh, the Investor Advisory Service leaves the stock picking to subscribers. So uh, the way that uh, Holbert and his team, they have, he actually has a, a team of, of advisors who evaluate each newsletter and determine how to uh, compare IES to every other newsletter that's out there, so that uh, um, he's uh, so that he can rationalize uh, the performance. So for the IES, uh, the system that he has in place uh, requires monthly rebalancing uh, based on all stocks that are in the buy zone, uh, and then he allocates reallocates monthly based on uh, buying and selling stocks that are only in the buy zone. So uh, this is, you know, we this is probably not the way that I would have uh, suggested tracking the performance. But again, he's the expert, and I know he has to put us up against uh, other newsletters that operate in a different fashion, that are less research newsletters than uh, portfolio advisors. Uh, and so uh, the the there are upsides and the downsides. At the end of the day, we're pretty ambivalent about whether this is the right strategy or not. Uh, when we're only buying the buy stocks, that often includes stocks that are beaten down. So maybe there's a, uh, so we're picking up the stocks that are that are perhaps more undervalued. Uh, on the other side, we're not letting the uh, prices uh, run for the best performing stocks because they get out of the buy range. Um, they continue to be holding uh, holds from our perspective and might contribute to the additional upside of our, uh, of our returns. Uh, so it's sort of, from our perspective, it all comes out 
in, a, in the wash at the end of the day. Uh, and so this representative performance figure we feel captures the uh, general course and speed of our approach uh, and quantifies it in a way that that uh, is defensible from Holbert's perspective, and we can uh, we can point to it and say, yeah, this is um, uh, at any point in time. If you were uh, picking stocks out of the newsletter that were in the buy zone, this would be uh, the uh, this would be an approximation of what you might be able to achieve. Um, you know, we do have the the sell uh, sell above prices. That we suggest, and it's very rare that stocks reach that point because uh, they're they're constantly changing and it being updated on a monthly basis, uh, on a regular basis, not necessarily a monthly basis. Um, so uh, uh, David says, does Mark Hulbert still perform this and uh, perform this service? And yes, he did. He discontinued his printed newsletter, uh, the Hulbert Financial Digest. Um, it was acquired. Uh, and then uh, by uh, by Dow Jones, uh, in the end, uh, they discontinued the newsletter. It, it's just it was just small small peanuts to uh, their organization, so they discontinued the newsletter. Uh, but he continued to offer it as a uh, as a um, a service to newsletters. So we pay him to calculate our returns, as does every newsletter that he tracks. So from our perspective, this is an independent auditor uh, looking at our picks in real time and uh, keeping track of them over the history of the newsletter uh, and then um, uh, publishing these ratings on a regular basis. Uh, he continues to uh, publish his annual honor roll uh, of top performing consistent performing newsletters, which we've been on that list for 10 years uh, in a row. Uh, with uh, this last year, there were, I think, six, six newsletters on the, uh, on the honor roll, uh, where we are the one of three that have been on it uh, every year in the last 10 years. Uh, we are also the, had the third best rate of return of any of the six newsletters. Um, so uh, we're, we're pretty pleased with that recognition as well. We're pretty unique in that perspective. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, if you check out the InvestorAdvisoryService.com website and look in the uh, About section there, you'll see the track record. You'll see an awards uh, menu item as well, uh, which will give you more details on the uh, the Holbert Honor Roll. Um, so that's the Investor Advisory Service. Now, the Small Cap Informer, uh, we track the performance of these picks um, uh, ourselves. We use our My Stock Portfolio tool, so we invest an equal amount into each pick, uh, and then we benchmark it against the S&P Small Cap 600. So. This is different from the Holbert approach, um, but again, we're not, uh, the, our, the small cap and former subscriber base isn't large enough to justify um, uh, the, the, the expense of the third party uh, performance valuation, but we do, validation rather, but we do have, uh, we do have all of this data available uh, so that we can, we can calculate it and look at it. So uh, the green is the small cap informer and the blue is the S&P small cap 600. Um, so from left to right is the year to date. Uh, so our picks down on average 23%, but the S&P small cap 600 was down 33%. Lifetime to date, we're up almost 4% while the a year, while the S&P small cap 600 uh, let, since um, uh, 2012 is down almost 6% a year. Uh, 2019 was a good year for us. We outperformed the S&P small cap 628.4 to 25.6%. The last three years, 2017 to 19, up almost 10% while the a year, while the S&P small cap 600 down 14% a year. And then over the last five years, 2015 to 2019, up 7.6%, uh, while the S&P small cap 600 down 5.8%. Uh, a year. So uh, we're very pleased with, with the results of that performance. Again, it's slightly different from the way that uh, Holbert calculates his newsletter performance, but uh, 
our rationale is we're looking at the performance of the all the stats. Uh, and again, it's not something that you would get unless you were using a service perhaps like Folio and you were rebalancing or reinvesting each month, you might be able to replicate it. Uh, but from our perspective, this captures the underlying change in valuation plus dividends of all of the stocks that we track uh, in the newsletter. Um, and so that, again, is our uh, objective. Uh, we feel like we're, we're uh, consistently coming in ahead of the index that we track, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, just to note, on the last five years um, in the market, uh, small caps, I think, outperformed large caps in just one of those years. If you go back uh, 10, 15 years, um, it's uh, the other way around. Small caps outperformed the majority of, of years. Uh, so th this is just one of those periods where we're seeing small caps uh, trail the large caps. But uh, again, as I mentioned, we would expect as the economy hits the trough, and then begins to expand again, that we'd see strength coming from small caps uh, that would exceed uh, large company stocks. And that's why uh, portfolio diversification rules that are taught by Better Investing suggest including small caps, mid-sized stocks, and large stocks in your portfolio so that you can benefit no matter where investors are moving uh, in the herd towards which types of stocks, um, smaller stocks, larger stocks, and how the economy is impacting those companies. Uh, so Greg asks, is your performance based on equal shares in the stocks you have in the newsletter? Um, so if you're referring to the small cap informer, yes, the assumption is uh, that when we recommend a stock, uh, we take the closing price the day at the, the first market day after publication, um, and then we invest the same amount of, uh, we assume uh, an equal purchase in uh, each stock as of uh, that date. So it's uh, equal equal dollar amounts of the stock. Um, again, as a hypothetical uh, calculation of performance, that would make sense because we're comparing then against the benchmark. Um, so we uh, the way that we calculate the benchmark portfolio performance in our My iClub and our My Stock Portfolio websites is that we assume for every purchase or sale of a stock, we are also purchasing uh, or selling an equal dollar amount of the underlying index. Uh, and so that's uh, when it all kind of kind of wraps up. Uh, I will uh, I will add that uh, we've had significantly more stocks that have been discontinued in the small cap and former, and that was pretty much uh, what we expected when we launched the newsletter in 2012. But the average uh, proceeds from stocks that were discontinued either for overvaluation um, or were uh, purchased, at, acquired, uh, merged with other companies and therefore were discontinued uh, or were having fundamental problems um, is uh, the, the losing stocks uh, that were discontinued. Uh, the average return is one to two percent. Uh, so uh, we thought that's a pretty good, that's pretty interesting. I'll do some more analysis on that uh, as we've been as we've been tracking it. Uh, but uh, uh, it's good to know that on average, it, we're getting out around even for the stocks that we've been discontinued. And that includes some whopping failures, some stocks that just didn't work out, as well as some stocks that just seem to reach um, reach uh, valuation levels that were perhaps a little uh, excessive. Uh, and some of those stocks have gone on and continued to sell at those excessive levels. Uh, and that's something that I'm also looking at, how we can figure out. Uh, as Christian said, uh, is asking the question, what's my take on using uh, stop losses or trailing stop losses now uh, that most positions are back to pre-COVID pricing. And that's exactly what I'm thinking about. Um, and uh, maybe we'll take a look at that next month. Uh, I've mentioned it, I've mentioned it in a couple of my webinars. I've done classes on using trailing stop loss orders. I'm doing some work with our programmers now about figuring out what the range is um, and some aids to set those trailing stop losses. Uh, and again, the idea is that uh, you would be able to benefit from the stock as it's going up, but if it makes a sudden reversal, you'd be able to liquidate the position, um, preserve your gains. If the stock continued to go down, at some point you could repurchase it um, without concern about uh, wash sales because you you had a gain um, that you you that you uh, incurred. Again, you'd set it on a stock by stock 
portfolio by portfolio basis. So um, you could avoid uh, um, uh, in a taxable portfolio, maybe you wouldn't sell uh, while you would in a tax deferred or tax advantaged portfolio so that you wouldn't have to worry about capital gains. So this is definitely something that we're, I'm working towards. Uh, and when you look at what happened this year, uh, you can make the pros, the, the case either way. If we go back to uh, uh, back to the market, let me just, uh, uh, so uh, slide, I'm gonna jump back to uh, slide. slide 10 yeah and so uh, essentially a trailing stop loss might would uh, uh, you would set it uh, over here when the market is at, at, at a particular level at the start of the year um, you could set your stock stop loss and say if the stock goes down seven percent uh, from the high price that it reaches um, and every time it makes a new high that seven percent floor uh, steps up behind the stock so your seven seven per seven percent uh, decline. Let me grab my pen and I'll just uh, try to illustrate this. Um, so, so maybe this would be seven percent. So, if the if the stock reached this point, but as the stock continued to go up, your your stop continues to to increase as well. And so maybe here's seven percent. So, uh, and then at the peak right here, uh, you'd have your highest stop. Uh, because uh, even though every time the stock goes down, it doesn't adjust the trailing stop loss. The trailing stop loss only changes when the stock goes up. So we have the stock peaking right here at 7%. So let's say if that's 7%, so here would be your sale. Uh, but uh, if you look at the difference, I'll change color of my pencil here so we can uh, 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 kind of look at it. If you had set it over here, well, the market is looking pretty overvalued, so I'm gonna I'm gonna think about selling it over here. Well, you've just lost out on uh, this uh, uh, this range from here to here of uh, of gains in your uh, in your uh, portfolio. So that's the philosophy. Um, of course, when we're looking at something like this, if you sold it here. Um, you'd be very happy at this point, all right, when the the, the, the poor stock bottomed out because um, you'd be going, oh, gosh, look at all of this uh, loss that I just uh, uh, that I just avoided. And so at any point along the way, if there's all these, you know, kind of little fake, uh, uh, fake drop offs. If you rebought at any of those points um, by the beginning of April, right, we'd be back. You'd be back in the in um, in in the green. You'd be back in positive territory. Um, so you know, again, you could reset your seven percent or whatever the percentage is decline. You know, maybe here, maybe that's you know, you're, you might have gotten triggered at that point, but it would keep every time the stock reaches a new high. That's a new. Uh, that is when the um, uh, the stop loss goes up. So. Um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting concept. The downside, of course, is that uh, you have to know what the what's the right percentage. Um, and now, uh, when we look back at the last 52 weeks, uh, every stock has got this. You know, just about every stock in the market has a giant 30% decline uh, in March. Uh, and uh, so that's going to make it harder to determine what's what's a reasonable um, stop. Uh, stop level to, to set. Uh, but we're going to do some work on it and uh, see what we can kind of come up with that might uh, that might help things out. And so, yeah, again, uh, I think stop losses are really valuable when you've got big gains uh, that you, that you want to sort of, uh, uh, and you're worried that there will be a market reset that's going to wipe out those gains. Then your trailing stop loss works uh, a little bit better and uh, will allow you to kind of um, uh, allow you to to you know protect gains and uh, move forward um, with your portfolio. Um, I wanted to just conclude by uh, talking about three kind of talking points that I that I uh, things that I've been thinking about um, that to help you figure out some clarity for your portfolio um, when you're looking at stocks that you own when you're looking at stocks that you're considering. Um, I, you know, I really think we should be thinking of what's the impact of this recession 
uh, and uh, COVID-19. And we're seeing, um, we're seeing more and more talk about alphabet economics, about the V-shaped recovery, the U-shaped recovery, the L-shaped recovery, where the recovery period takes very, very long, the square root recovery, where we see uh, the economy bottoming, recovering, and then flatlining before re resuming growth. Uh, and um, the longer that the effects of COVID-19 are uh, uncontrolled, uh, the more the risk that we have that recovery is going to take longer than ever. Um, on the uh, uh, and that's not to say that uh, you know again certain segments are getting hammered. Um, restaurant stocks are getting hammered, especially casual dining uh, restaurants and independent uh, restaurants, but as well as chain restaurants. But, um, you know, um, uh, there are also other factors at, at play. Uh, some uh, operators, for instance, we cover Meritage, uh, Meritage Hospitality Group, which is an operator of Wendy's uh, franchise restaurants, and they have some other brands as well in Michigan. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, out of the couple hundred stores that they operate, um, only a handful of them ever closed down, uh, per, uh, closed down the entire restaurant. The rest of them had uh, drive throughs and they were able to maintain business. Um, Wendy's launched breakfast during this quarter. Um, so that was a that got a little positive uplift because that was something new and people were craving, have been craving variety, something different. Uh, People are getting tired of pizza uh, because you know that's easy to get, but uh, they're they're craving different things. Uh, so that they've actually per been performing reasonably well. But other, I saw another uh, uh, operator, Pizza Hut, and Wendy's uh, re franchises that uh, had filed for bankruptcy. And again, you got to look at the financial statements. Yes, if you've leveraged uh, your balance sheet to provide for the acquisition of of the land and to, to buy the, the franchising rights to to build your restaurants, et cetera, um, yeah, that that could get, have a big impact on whether or not you're going to survive this pandemic. So we need to take a look at again, don't just uh, make assumptions. Oh, all restaurants are going to perform poorly. Some will be able, might see, obviously see sales and earnings decline, but will still be able to uh, maintain a certain level of operations and profitability. Um, but so we got to think about the positive and negative factors. As I mentioned, Winnebago, um, the standard rule of thumb says during a recession, don't buy RV stocks because um, that's when people are not buying RVs. Uh, they, they're, they're worried about losing their job. They're not worried uh, about uh, what they're doing on vacation. But again, th these are different times. So uh, that makes it a little bit different. Uh, Bonnie asks, I see about, is this a good time for Winnebago? I think my conclusion about Winnebago is that it's a little pricey right now. Um, you know, but again, as we hear more from the second quarter, uh, we might gain more information. Um, so we got to we got to maintain flexibility. We got to watch a dynam dynamic situation, um, accumulate information. We will have opportunities, uh, but certainly if you own Winnebago, I wouldn't be a seller of it at this point. Um, and uh, see if those trends continue to maintain. It may be that if the recession and COVID-19 uh, continue to run rampant, that there will be some exhaustion of resources and consumers will reach the point where they, they, they feel like that's not a prudent purchase to be making right now. Um, and so they'll step down. Um, Winnebago did report that RV sales are up, but towables were down. And again, that kind of makes sense. A towable requires uh, you to have a vehicle that can tow those uh, types of big uh, big campers, but they are making more of the smaller ones that will fit with a passenger car. And, and uh, uh, they also noted that the average, per the age of the average purchaser has been trending down as well. It's no longer the uh, retired or semi-retired couple, but millennials are kind of interested in this idea, especially um, these micro campers where it's it's really, t they're tiny, they're like tiny homes on wheels. Um, they feel like they provide them with freedom and flexibility uh, and a little bit of comfort, uh, a little step up from camping on the ground perhaps, but um, um, so there, there are different trends that kind of come into place. Uh, so we've been talking about, uh, uh, if you've seen in the various webinars they've been doing uh, for Better Investing and for the Toolkit webinar and here uh, it, back in May, uh, 
looking at looking at analyst expectations over the next next couple of years and quantifying that in our toolkit. Uh, the um, um, did someone ask about the? Oh uh, yeah, so Tom asks if we'll be uh, upgrading toolkit to automate the use of uh, earnings or oh, adjusted funds from operations when projecting REIT earnings. Um, we won't be doing that <clears throat> in toolkit. Um, it's possible that we are testing the use of funds from operations for real estate investment trusts at our equity research service website, which is a premium subscriber tool. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and we actually have downloadable um, investors toolkit SSG files that you can download. You can actually import those into um, SSG plus as well, save them to your computer, import them that way. Um, and the idea is we're testing uh, the data that we get from Morningstar for funds from operations. They have some quirks, um, so we're kind of testing it out. If it works, at some point that could get added to SSG Plus. That would be the route that they would go. Um, it, it wouldn't, uh, we're at this point, we've uh, pretty much established that we're not gonna be uh, uh, tinkering with the internals of toolkit uh, because we run the risk of uh, uh, breaking the program so that the antivirus companies would lock everyone out from uh, using it. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's unfortunate, but uh, we've reached a point where that's not really possible. So it would be possible, however, using ERS to download the uh, ITK file for a REIT that you were following. Um, we have REIT screening as well at that website. And then you'd be able to manually update. Uh, we're providing the quarterly, uh, on the website, the quarterly updates we're providing, so you could key those in manually. Um, but it gives you one resource. Uh, not all REITs report funds from operations or adjusted funds from operations um, per share. Um, you know, so there's a lot of calculations that might be required. So this kind of cuts through and makes it a little easier. It makes it a whole lot easier, actually, because you don't have to create the, the uh, initial SSG um, using funds from operations. So you've got something to start from. You can make updates as you go. So that's uh, what we're, where we start, are started with uh, what we're working on uh, in terms of that. Um, uh, so back to uh, the effects of a recession. Uh, let's, I, don't, I would caution anyone uh, against downplaying the downside, uh, what's happening as we, uh, as we go. There's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, we have a tendency, that's one of the cognitive biases uh, of human behavior is uh, that, we, that we minimize the risk. <clears throat> it's the classic uh, gambler's conundrum where uh, gamblers always think there's an upside. Uh, and they always rationale that, ration, uh, rationalize that they are due for the upside. Uh, they're due for a win. And when they get a win, it's a big jolt of adrenaline, a big positive feeling. Uh, it causes them to forget about the downside. And uh, if you do that long enough, uh, you'll end up broke uh, or worse than broke. Uh, so uh, we want to continue to think about the downside. Don't let the downside rule us, but don't downplay it as well. Um, there's still a lot of moving parts in this market, in this economy. Uh, in this pandemic, uh, and uh, as they all come together, um, there could be pathways that are really undesirable. Um, and so uh, if you make big bets in one direction or another, um, you could be uh, susceptible to greater damage, I think, than you wanted to undertake in your portfolio. Um, think about the near-term versus the long-term prog prognosis. I've been talking about near-term, long-term, and mid-term. Uh, mid-term referring to that period between one and, say, three to four years. Um, uh, and that's going to be the recovery period for the economy and for many companies. Um, you know, I'm looking at many companies thinking, gosh, it's going to be two to three fiscal years from now before earnings reach the level that they were in 2019. Uh, and so um, if that's your uh, understanding of and your belief, um, we're really looking at two to three years to four years of dead money for many companies because the fundamentals won't support a price that uh, will get you back to where you were last year. So uh, I think, and the pro bigger problem is that's really frustrating to be sitting around waiting for that expected recovery to be happening. Um, and so as we look at various troubled sectors and industries, uh, there can be a lot of deep discounts available and they might be a little alluring, especially as 
stocks that are more defensive and stocks that the large caps um, are uh, trading at relatively high multiples. Um, you know, we can if we are totally drawn to these high total return candidates, we could end up uh, getting frustrated with those. So we need to think about it. Um, I've been channeling my energy towards finding more defensive stocks, healthcare stocks, um, and consumer defensive companies, uh, companies that may have some some inside path of dealing with the pandemic uh, or supporting efforts to fight against. And one of them, uh, those is John Bean Technologies, ticker is JBT, that we started covering in the small cap informer. Uh, why this company has got two businesses. One of them is they make equipment for uh, uh, passenger and freight airlines and airports. Okay, so that business, boy, little little tricky right now. But the other side of their business is food processing automation, robotics, uh, materials that uh, take the entire process of producing uh, foods from uh, livestock all the, uh, and grains all the way to end user packaging. Um, and uh, the thinking is, gosh, uh, this it can be a much healthier way to process foods. Many big industrial food companies are, are going to be increasingly taking the humans, uh, the transmitters of the virus out of the equation so that their food is never touched or uh, by human hands uh, as it goes through the entire process and automates that yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was a, a story on uh, the automation of uh, the food industry. Uh, kind of speaking to that trend, I was happy to see that. So again, to me, here's a company that may have uh, some opportunities in the current marketplace, um, stock that I've followed for a long time, they've been very expensive and now all of a sudden they're reasonably priced and they've got something that I think the market and uh, many businesses will be looking for. Uh, so, uh, I, all, you know, I think goes without saying as well that uh, at this point you probably have a good bead on on the dividend payers in your portfolio and whether those dividends are going to be increased, if they're going to be decreased, if they're going to be held uh, at the same level. Uh, let's just be aware that with capital so cheap, uh, it's possible for many companies to have been drawing down on their credit lines or borrowing money, um, keeping cash on the books uh, that they would use to pay dividends. Um, that can be good, again, in the short term, in the long term, um, not the most effective use of capital. Um, so you would want to watch, uh, look for those. Um, it, uh, there were questions about debt um, uh, that periodically um, people ask. And uh, I'll be publishing an article on our blog, our iClub blog, and uh, on the Small Cap Informer website, I think, uh, on dealing with debt and questions to ask. The bottom line for me is I'm not so worried about uh, companies that pass all the other tests of management uh, and the growth of earnings and revenues that we apply using Toolkit, using the SSG. Uh, generally, those companies are managing the resources effectively. So if their debt is a little bit higher, it probably means that they're leveraging um, that debt for greater gains than some of their peers. Um, it's not a, for, for those companies, it's an offensive strategy to borrow money because it makes them grow faster. It allows them to make acquisitions that make their own shareholders richer. Uh, and so generally, that's my rule of thumb and I don't get too hung up in um, uh, a debt analysis for that reason. We will look at the amount of debt on the balance sheet um, and the, the debt to equity, debt to total cap. But um, uh, I'm not, by and large, with debt so cheap right now, capital so inexpensive, it's not a, a giant concern. But again, for dividend payers, you, you just you want to look at it and make sure that uh, they can support that dividend. And then finally, look at your portfolio and think about defense. Um, for us, defensive investing means making sure that you've got coverage and utilities, uh, consumer defensive or consumer staples and healthcare uh, stocks. And I, I'm surprised at the number of opportunities that I'm coming across in the healthcare sector for stocks that are reasonably valued relative to their growth. Uh, and this doesn't even require um, a lot of speculation in terms of FDA approvals, although that, that would provide uplift for some of the companies that we follow. Uh, but uh, uh, our companies tend to be not one product companies. They've got a couple of products. They're maximizing their um, uh, opportunities, uh, looking for new indications for their existing uh, product line. 
as well as making other medical devices um, that are that are needed and required in uh, the healthcare sector. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, utility stocks. <clears throat> um, I you know again, I think there are managed ETFs that uh, might be worth taking a look at if if you do your research and you believe there might be an uplift uh, coming for utility companies. There's an ETF with the ticker symbol UTES, uh, I believe, that is a managed ETF, which means they screen utility stocks uh, and then they eliminate the lower quality, uh, lower return candidates. Uh, and they have done very well. They've outperformed the utility index over time. Um, they pay a a pretty good dividend again a good way to get exposure to utilities if that's where you're interested uh if you if that's where you're interested in that that is a defensive play that will help uh, provide some core holdings in your portfolio we won't expect those utility stocks to see much of a decline and if you uh, believe what the analysts are projecting um, you might get an additional uptick uplift uh, in your portfolio from holding some uh, utility stocks uh, and then consumer defensive consumer staple stocks Again, uh, hard to find good values because those stocks um, have been, uh, investors have been flocking to those companies. But uh, to reiterate, uh, that would include uh, discount stores. I mean, Ollie's has performed very well uh, and have they pivoted towards providing more essential goods and services as opposed to, or essential goods rather than uh, some of the other uh, fare that they've tended to offer. Uh, and that's brought in a, a new crowd of consumers and uh, building up a new, uh, a new, um, a new uh, class of customers uh, and uh, uh, finding it to be a, an effective strategy. Uh, they had some struggles in 2019, the death of their uh, CEO and some expansion issues with some of the uh, Toys R Us locations that they took over. Uh, but uh, it seems like a lot of those have been ironed out. And so I'm pretty, really pleased to have stuck with uh, Ollie's. Uh, and again, but right now, they're a little, they're a little pricey, uh, but Dollar General in the same boat. Um, Walmart has, seems to be performing pretty well. Uh, other grocery stores, uh, but again, hard to find good prices, good valuations. But when you can, uh, I think those are those are some opportunities uh, that you might take a look at. Um, and again, I, I was going to add slide four here just uh, um, um, to talk a little bit about the importance of thinking with a little bit of skepticism about uh, what you think you know or what others seem to tell you about uh, about the market uh, i would i would advise you to listen to my opinions and record them as opinions and, and not as facts not as prognostications uh, but uh, to do research that would confirm uh, your own beliefs. It's just a, a, my idea is to, to spark a line of inquiry that would, might help you uh, to think about things in a different light. Um, and I've talked about Disney uh, uh, for over the last couple of months. Uh, in the first weeks of the market correction in March, uh, Disney was one of the big stocks that investment clubs were purchasing. And uh, that's not probably not been a good uh, a good move for many of them. Um, I think the the thinking was, well, that new Disney Plus streaming service is going to be fabulous, and that's going to get millions of subscribers, and um, you know it's going to really help the company. But the big big part of Disney's business are the the theme parks, the hotels, the cruise line, um, and that is all ground to a halt. Uh, just reopened in Florida. And again, it's not clear how long that may stick uh, before they have to close again. Um, and uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, and it, when you start looking into the Disney Plus streaming service, well, the first year uh, is uh, the revenues are gonna be pretty, pretty slim because of all of the discounting and the marketing and the free trials and the promotional offers. Uh, if you have a Verizon, unlimited cell phone account, you got a year of Disney Plus for free. Uh, so the the revenues in this first year are probably not going to be uh, as uh, as robust as I think some people assume. Uh, so you got to look at the analysis and you got to uh, really think about that particular business right now. I'm not saying that Disney's going to go out of business. I'm not saying that Disney's a bad investment right now. But if your expectation is that Disney is going to be the same company in 2021 that they were in 2019, uh, that uh, I think is up for debate. Uh, and uh, so that 
a level of critical thinking really becomes much more important uh, in the face of all of this uncertainty. And I think a lot of people would be better served to stick away, stay away from some of those opportunities that they seem to, that seem to be too good to be true as we go forward. All right. Um, so Tom says the name of the food robotics company, John Bean Technologies, J-B-T is the ticker symbol there. <clears throat> um, uh, Jay asks my Opinion on LGI homes and century communities. Uh, these are two home building stocks that we cover in the small cap and former um, century communities. Uh, when we started buying them, was one of the started covering them a couple of years ago. Was one of the top 25 home builders in the U.S. Now they're in the top 10. They've acquired some businesses. They've just grown. Both those companies are profitable. Housing starts in the last month have been terrific. Uh, home sales are going up. The average prices are going up. And again, the traditional wisdom says during a recession, home builders suffer. Uh, well, this is not a traditional recession, I don't think, uh, and so the traditional wisdom doesn't apply. Um, I think some of the trends that we had been seeing that were supporting these entry-level home builders, right? So they're building first-time homes in communities for uh, uh, for uh, for homeowners. Uh, often, it's the first time they're they're making a purchase. Uh, so uh, we're seeing. Uh, the trends out of the urban areas into the suburbs uh, that the gen the millennial um, generation is uh, kind of getting fed up with living downtown, uh, living in the cities, uh, what is settling down now uh, and um, is uh, uh, looking to start a family and thinking, let's get one of these houses that has a high speed internet already pre-wired in it, that has options for solar energy or wind energy. Uh, generation uh, that are in attractive communities with other like-minded people, that this is uh, uh, becomes a, a more appealing option. And I think that there's, uh, that the pandemic may, where, where all of a sudden now a little bit more distancing is required, may actually be driving some people to make that decision and say, all right, we're, that's, this is it, we're, we've got to get out. We've been talking about getting out of the city and now I think it's time. Let's go take let's let's go uh, take a look and see if we can um, um, uh, if we're going to be working from home anyway. It would be better that instead of working from an apartment in the city um, to have a home where we've got uh, plenty of room in the backyard. So uh, I, I'm very optimistic about those companies. I think that they will continue to perform well. I expect that housing will continue to go up to go down. We're not at pre-2007 level, levels yet uh, in terms of new homes. Uh, I also like Essent Financial for the same reason, private mortgage insurance company. Um, that's taking market share from bigger players because of their adept use of technology. Uh, and that, again, feeds into demand for first-time homes. If that's going up, we would also see a demand in uh, a, the requirement that borrowers have private mortgage insurance. Uh, and so that would support companies like Essence. So that feeds into the same thesis. And I think over the long term, uh, those are probably pretty good um, uh, good uh, opportunities and uh, companies to look at if you can find them at reasonable prices. And again, that's going to be the struggle there. All right. Uh, here's uh, <laughs> everything has been moved online. Uh, I have two events here upcoming uh, that are in person. Um, so uh, July, this coming Saturday, I'll be presenting to the AAAII and Better Investing Metro DC chapter, doing an online event for them. Uh, the Money Show has been moving primarily online. There's one August 3rd to 5th and another August 24th to 26th. Um, you should be getting emails from uh, Better Investing and or iClub Central about those. Uh, August 15th for the Better Investing Central Pennsylvania chapter. Uh, so the there is a money show in person scheduled for Sarasota, Florida, September 10th to 12th. Uh, and again, whether that happens or not uh, remains to be seen, but it is scheduled to be a live, a live show, and they are charging for admission to uh, to keep the attendance low and to provide maximum distancing. Uh, I've got an event for the Dallas chapter uh, and for the Puget Sound chapter, and those are 
online as well. And uh, that Puget Sound date uh, is subject to change. It's probably not going to be that November 7th. So, uh, but to keep that in mind, um, December 5th, um, perhaps I'll be in person in Philadelphia, but again, it remains to be seen how things uh, are going by that time. Uh, and then another money show at the end of the year, as well as the monthly webinars. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, here uh, to continue to provide as much education and insight uh, and ideas for your portfolio as possible through uh, all of these different events and to help the various better investing chapters. As always, my mantra has been keep calm and stay the course. Uh, doesn't uh, pay to panic uh, and uh, just to keep making rational decisions for your portfolio. Remember that you don't have to jump in all at once uh, into the deep end of the pool, that you can wade into stocks that you like a little bit at a time. If you're a little worried about whether the stocks are going to go up or going to go down, um, that might be a, a strategy that you would consider as you're going forward. But we're remaining fully invested in stocks. We're remaining focused on 2024, 2025, uh, five years down the road, when hopefully uh, this recession, this pandemic, uh, and this market year, bear market will be. Uh, and I know we're not really in a bear market, we're in a pseudo bear market, uh, we'll just be distant memories by that point. So thanks again uh, for stopping by. We'll look forward to seeing you next month at our next Lunchtime Stock Club webinar.